Danielle Red Redlick is accused of second-degree murder. She's facing those charges for killing, allegedly, her husband. Sean Wiggins is prosecuting this case, and he is beginning his opening statement right now. January 12th, 2019, at about 7 in the morning. Mrs. Redlick is awake in her Winter Park home that she shares with her husband of over 15 years, Michael Redlick. The home that she shares with her two minor children, Jaden and Sawyer Redlick. And she is doing what many of us do when we first wake up in the morning. She's on her phone. However, this morning, is unlike any other morning because approximately nine hours before this moment in time, that defendant plunged a knife into the shoulder of Michael Redlick, which would cause him to bleed to death in that home they shared. The home that she is standing in in this moment in time, looks like something from a horror movie. It is 7.22 in the morning. And Ms. Redlick opens up her dating website. And she views the conversations that she's been carrying on. Through the course of this trial, you are going to learn about a number of individuals. You're going to learn about Michael and Danielle and Jaden and Sawyer. And what you'll learn about Michael is, is this. He was a senior executive with multiple um, professional sports teams. He left the professional sports arena and moved to the Central Florida area to work as the uh, Director of External Affairs and Partnerships at the UCF DeVos Sports Management Program. He's a dedicated father. He's a husband. He is a person, and like all people, has his faults. But the evidence will show at the time of the murder that the relationship, which had been terrible for so, so long, was one that Michael had not given up on, was one that he still wanted to make work. You will learn that Danielle um, is quite a bit younger than Michael. She was a stay-at-home mom to the two children, which, of course, is a, a significant job in and of itself. And you will learn that Danielle Redlick had been extraordinarily unhappy in this marriage for a half a decade or more. You'll learn that in January and February of 2018, Ms. Redlick comes to believe that Mr. Redlick has been unfaithful. And this would seem to lead to a major decision, uh, which was the defendant's choice to file for divorce. She would ultimately abandon that effort, but in that time period, Michael moves out of the house. He moves to sort of a nearby residence or a nearby town home um, and does everything he can to maintain his relationship with his children. But Michael wasn't done with the marriage. Michael wasn't done wanting to live under that roof, under the roof that he would be murdered in. And so in October of 2018, thereabouts, Mr. Redlick moves back into the home. And what you'll hear from the Redlick children is that there's sort of this period where what was frequently a very... Um, toxic relationship between the parents seemed to be trending in a better direction. Um, it, there wasn't quite the number of arguments. 
and maybe things were starting to improve. But in December, Ms. Redlick, the defendant, makes a fateful decision. She joins a dating site called meetmindful.com. Um, and you're gonna hear from the owner of that dating website, uh, Keith Gruen, and you're going to see the records related to um, Ms. Redlick's membership in that dating website. Um, and that she put herself down in December, uh, December 5th of 2018, is that she was looking for a long-term relationship. This is the dating website that that defendant opens while her husband is laid out dead on the floor. It will be clear from Ms. Redlick's own statements that you hear in various recordings, her activity on that dating website, that Ms. Redlick never wanted to make this relationship work. That she was done. Despite the fact that she didn't go through the divorce, she was not interested in a life with Mr. Redlick. She wanted to be happy. And happiness for Ms. Redlick was a life beyond Michael. Let's return back to that home on January 12th, 2019. Ms. Redlick stops browsing Meet Mindful and she begins to search. And what you're gonna see through the course of this case are a number of exhibits that were produced from a digital forensic extraction from Ms. Redlick's phone. And so you'll see search history and web history and, and things of, of uh, that nature. And what you'll see from these searches is that right around that time, right, a, right after she's done on the dating website, she begins searching um, for how to slit her wrists. This is at seven o'clock in the morning. And you'll see that seven o'clock turns into eight o'clock. So now we're 10 hours since she murdered her husband and she continues to Google how to slit her wrists. She makes it to a website. How long does it take to bleed to death after slitting your wrists? Eight o'clock turns into nine o'clock. Mr. Redlick has now been dead in that home for 11 hours. It is now 9.28 in the morning. Miss Redlick picks up the phone and for the first time connects to 911. And what you will hear, because you'll hear that recording, is Miss Redlick says in the first words out of her mouth, the first version of events that she provides, standing in what appears to be out of a horror movie, I think my husband is deceased. He might have died of a heart attack. That's the first version she provides. What you will learn throughout the course of this case is that Miss Redlick makes many, many statements concerning the circumstances of Michael's death. And although the details will change from statement to statement, often in very significant ways, Danielle Redlick maintains she did not kill her husband. Why? Why does Ms. Redlick say after 11 hours in that home with that dead man that she thinks that he died of a heart attack? The evidence is going to show that from the start, this defendant did everything she could to avoid responsibility for her actions. So what has she been doing for the last 11 hours? The evidence will show that she engages in a significant but failed attempt to clean up the scene. You're going to see the photographs from when law enforcement arrived, everything that Ms. Redlick did to try 
to avoid responsibility, to try to make this seem like something that it wasn't. Blood-soaked towels, mops soaked in blood. A five-gallon bucket full of pinkish water. The smell of cleaning fluid striking the nose of the law enforcement officers and CSIs that enter that home. Blood in the primary bedroom shower, which you will learn because you're going to hear from a DNA analyst from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, is Michael's DNA, is Michael's blood. So to have a, a clear picture, as clear a picture as you can about this crime scene and what Ms. Redlick in fact did, the state of Florida is going to present to you the testimony of an expert witness by the name of Stuart James. He is a expert in blood stain pattern analysis. And what he's going to tell you is he's going to tell you that he looked at all the photos in the scene and he can offer some descriptions about what the blood says about what happened. How there are stains that are um, sort of textbook examples of wipes with an object. That this scene had basically been obliterated by Miss Redlick. What he'll tell you is, is had Miss Redlick not chosen to try to make this seem like it was something it was not, had she not endeavored to clean up this horror scene, he may have been able to tell you where the stabbing occurred and where Mr. Redlick walked after he was stabbed. But because of this defendant's efforts to cover things up, he won't be able to offer you that testimony. You're also going to hear from a number of individuals who have expertise in fields of digital forensics and cell phone analysis. Um, you're going to hear about, as you've already heard, this extraction that's produced from Ms. Redlick's phone. So in addition to getting the data from the phone, law enforcement requested what are called the call detail records from Ms. Redlick's phone and Mr. Redlick's phone. And what those are um, are records from the cellular provider that show calls and texts between numbers. We had those mapped. You're going to see a mapping presentation to sort of see where Mr. Redlick was, where Ms. Redlick was, sort of through this time period. But when you look in those records, you see something that you don't see in Ms. Redlick's phone. What you will learn is that the records from the cellular carrier show that Mr. and Mrs. Redlick were texting um, in, the, in the day leading up to his death. That is beyond dispute. But when the digital forensics person goes and extracts the phone, those text messages aren't there. Ms. Redlick has deleted those conversations. So in addition to obliterating the physical evidence on the scene, she obliterates any record of this particular conversation. And all of this relates to two things. The evidence that the state is going to offer to show Ms. Redlick's consciousness of guilt, as well as the evidence that she is, she is guilty of tampering in addition to murder. So I told you that Michael was stabbed in the shoulder. That's not the end of it. You will hear from the medical examiner, Dr. Sarah Zinovich, and she's going to talk to you about the many injuries that, that Mr. Redlick sustained, that he has multiple incised wounds. Incised wounds are wounds that come from a sharp and cutting object to his eye and to his torso, that he has bruising through his arm and chest and under his lip and on his temple. She will tell you how um, some of those bruises are characteristic of what can be referred to as defensive wounds. Now let's return back to that 911 call that's in progress. I told you that Ms. Redlick provides her first story, that he died, that she thinks he's dead, 
that she thinks it could be from a heart attack. Well, within a couple of breaths, we hear the second story. Ms. Redlick says that there was an altercation that she, she, hear it, she went and grabbed a knife, that Mr. Redlick took the knife from her and stabbed himself. So now he hasn't died of a heart attack, he's stabbed himself, and she runs to the bathroom, locks herself in the bathroom, and comes out sometime later and finds her husband dead on the floor. So within a couple of breaths of that first story, the jury, you, the jury, will hear the second story. Winter Park Police Department and EMTs arrive in response to this call, and they encounter Ms. Redlick. Um, because Ms. Redlick had followed through on those searches and in fact slit her wrists, both of her wrists, and bled all through the scene um, because of that choice, she is taken to the um, Advent Health Orlando Hospital. And what you will have an opportunity to review um, are a number of sort of sources of evidence from that hospital admission. You're gonna see photos of Ms. Redlick when she was at the scene. You're gonna see multiple photos of Ms. Redlick at the hospital taken by Winter Park Police Department. But in addition to that, you are going to hear from Dr. Kristen Vanderveld. Um, it's actually gonna be a video because she was not available um, to appear at this particular trial. Um, you're gonna see in that video, uh, her being the attending ER physician, what Ms. Redlick told her about her condition what Ms. Redlick said were her complaints and what she observed from her examination of Ms. Redlick. And ultimately, what you'll find out is that Ms. Redlick has slits to her wrist and a bruise on her arm. And that's it. Ms. Redlick, when she is confront or when she has had an opportunity to describe any complaints that she has to um, the doctor, that's all she says and the physical examination finds nothing else. I told you that Winter Park PD responds to the scene. The lead detective in this case who, who responds to the scene is Detective Pamela Ware. And De Detective Ware responds um, from the scene to the hospital to try to interview Ms. Redlick, in part because the whereabouts of the children are unknown, and in part because They've received this 911 call, a man has stabbed himself, a man has a heart attack. She's trying to get to the bottom of what, what they've just encountered inside this house. And we get more of a story from Ms. Redlick. Ms. Redlick tells Detective Ware about sort of the events that led up to Michael killing himself, because that's what she's saying, that Michael had found a text um, from another man on the phone and be had become very upset about it. And that that led to the argument and she, you'll hear all the details she gives and then that is the precipitating event that leads to apparently his suicide. Some of what you are going to hear about Michael Redlick throughout this case um, may not reflect positively on him. Um, Certainly the allegations of infidelity and maybe some aspects of how he reacts to finding out that his wife um, is talking to another man when they're on the mend is understandable and maybe some of it will not be understandable. Um, but that's for you to decide how important it is in determining whether Ms. Redlick is guilty of this crime. You'll learn that because Ms. Redlick has attempted to kill herself, and the evidence will show that this is another example of Ms. Redlick's efforts to avoid responsibility for this crime, that she's brought to a mental health facility. Um, she's been Baker Acted. And this Baker Act will lead to three additional statements that you hear. While in the Baker Act facility, this defendant calls Detective Ware. You'll hear the call. And I want you to listen closely to the call because a couple of things are going on in the call. One, you're gonna hear Miss Redlick 
probing for information. You're going to hear her hopeful, somehow hopeful, that this is not going to turn into a murder investigation. That law enforcement is going to encounter that scene and, and say, yep, you know, this looks like a suicide. Yep, maybe a heart attack and sort of close, close a book on it. You'll hear her hopeful that that outcome is still one that's possible. You'll hear her, and it, it's, a, it's a small detail, but pay attention. You'll hear Ms. Redlick say, what I told the dispatcher was the truth. She'll say, she'll maintain that the story she provides in that 911 call is the real story. I've already given you the real story. And she also will say something important. Ms. Redlick will say, I've already told the folks in here what happened. So what did she tell the folks in the mental health facility? Well, you'll hear. You're going to hear from Frederick Copeland, who was basically assigned to babysit Ms. Redlick. Um, completely unaffiliated with law enforcement, a third neutral party. Um, and you'll hear from Mr. Copeland that Ms. Redlick gives you know, maybe a slightly different version, but once again maintains that she did not kill her husband. So we have dispatcher, detective, Mr. Copeland. Then you're going to hear from another person who encountered Ms. Redlick while at that mental health facility, DCF Child Protective Investigator Terrilyn Tucker. And Ms. Tucker has to interview Ms. Redlick because the children have no, no one to be with. They have no local family, their father is dead, and their mother is committed to a mental facility. And so the Department of Children and Families can't just say, you know, hey kids, you figure it out. They have to make sure that whoever these children are going to end up with have been vetted, that the mother has been talked to. Ms. Tucker is not in law enforcement. Um, she has a separate role that relates to the welfare of children. And you will hear the detailed account that Ms. Redlick provides to Ms. Tucker. Once again, I did not kill my husband. I did not kill my husband. You'll also hear jail calls that Ms. Redlick placed while she was in custody. And you'll hear her say that she knew she was lying, that she was lying purposefully. And finally, you're going to hear a recorded statement from Ms. Redlick. Because on the 18th of uh, January, law enforcement, Ms. Redlick has been released, she's at her home, and they've obtained another search warrant to locate some additional items inside the home and to obtain Ms. Redlick's DNA. And you will hear Ms. Redlick incredulous that she's under investigation, unable to understand why the police would think she's responsible for what they encountered in that house on the 12th. And you will hear her plaintively say, I did not kill my husband. So if it wasn't clear from every other statement, she makes it loud and clear that Ms. Redlick is saying over and over again, I'm not responsible for this. This is six days later. She has 11 hours to come up with her first story and she had six hours, six full more days to, to continue to maintain this all along the way telling people that Mr. Redlick took his, took his own life. Because that's what Ms. Redlick has claimed throughout, with no qualifications. You're going to hear from a number of witnesses. You're going to hear from witnesses that knew Mr. Redlick from work. You're going to hear from witnesses that knew Michael from... Um, his involvement in his children's lives, you know, families that knew him from sports um, that Sawyer was involved in. 
they'll shed some light about the relationship. They will also shed some light about how Danielle and Michael were acting just hours before she murdered him. I mean, they'll also shed some light on the fact that Mr. Redlick never would have harmed himself. Despite what Ms. Redlick wants everyone to believe, Mr. Redlick would not have harmed himself. What the evidence is going to show throughout this case is that Ms. Redlick <clears throat> armed herself with a knife. She used that knife to cause multiple injuries to Mr. Redlick's body. One of those injuries was that stab to the shoulder, which enters, travels, hits these major veins, and punctures his lung, causing him to bleed to death on the floor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want you to remember that phrase, bleed to death, because it won't be the last time that you hear it in this case. The evidence will show from that point forward, this defendant did everything she could to avoid responsibility. She cleans up the scene, she deletes the text, and she tells everyone that will listen that she is not responsible for this crime. Members of the jury, throughout this case, the evidence will show that despite her many, many, many claims that she had nothing to do with this, in fact, she did. And in fact, she is guilty of second-degree murder with a weapon and tampering with evidence.